and uh, we will uh, look at chapter 3 together. As you turn there, let me just um, bow my head for just a moment, more, more so for me than, than for you, and just um, let's just ask the Lord to just be with us as we uh, look at what God has prepared for us today, okay? Father, I need your grace, and I need your love and your mercy. And so I, I'm so grateful that, Father, you've extended those to me. Um, and you have blessed in a tremendous way. And so we ask you to speak, Lord, because your servants are listening. Please, Father, give us the skill to handle the text accurately and for your glory. I love you. I thank you for these men that are preparing for ministry. And some of them are um, already right in, the, right in the midst of it and pastoring and um, missionaries. And oh, Father, just bless them tremendously. I love you and I thank you. It's in Jesus' strong and mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you should have a handout there. If you do not have a handout, raise your hand and I'll make sure our assistant gets you one. A couple of people down here. Um, and so they'll uh, get you a handout there. And I'll just be walking right along in those notes. You follow along um, as you look at those notes. And so let me ask this question to begin in, in terms of looking at Ruth chapter 3. Why... Oftentimes when we hear an Old Testament narrative preached, uh, why oftentimes do those sermons not feel like narratives? Or the way I put it in my notes is like this. Many Old Testament narrative sermons don't feel like a narrative. And so why is this? And by the way, does that matter? You know that uh, here at Southwestern Seminary, and one of the reasons you came to this conference is because we believe in text-driven preaching. And so, um, uh, you know, that means for us that we want to communicate the structure of the text, the substance of the text, and then that third rung in that foundational ladder is the spirit of the text. And oftentimes we emphasize this, the uh, structure and the substance, but we minimize this trying to communicate the spirit of the text. And I just want to encourage you and let you know that that's vitally important in terms of our text-driven preaching. Uh, in fact, I read John Claude, the 17th century Huguenot, talking about the spirit of the text long before we started talking about communicating the spirit of the text around here. And so it is vitally important. And so it, 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 it's a good way to start today. Why do so many Old Testament narrative sermons, why do they fall short of feeling like narratives? Well, number one, preachers haven't taken the time to do a genre analysis. That's why my colleague's book um, on preaching the genres, Dr. Stephen Smith's book, is so vital. I encourage you to, to pick that up and to read it uh, because um, so many people jettison the idea of doing a genre analysis. And so when you haven't taken the time to do a genre analysis, then um, obviously you're not going to be able to communicate the spirit of the text. And um, as you know, not all genres are the same. <laughs> you don't handle a... Um, uh, an Old Testament narrative the same way you would handle an epistle. And so uh, preachers haven't taken the time to do a genre analysis, so therefore um, they treat narratives the same way that they do other genres. Number two, and so they'll treat an Old Testament narrative the same way that they, they treat, for example, an epistle. And they especially will do this structurally. Um, so, you know, they, they will take a deductive outline and sort of force it upon a narrative text. Uh, they'll take a, um, a deductive outline with three points, you know, the old, old Baptist saying three points in a poem, and they'll force that into their Old Testament narratives as they preach through books. And so all their sermons feel the same, and um, they uh, sound the same, and they communicate the same spirit um, as they preach. And so... Um, we want to be careful that we um, understand and do a genre analysis and understand that um, narratives uh, do not, um, they're not to be handled the same way as the other genres. Um, some, some of the greats, by the way, were guilty of doing this. I, I was able to um, sit and listen to Dr. Adrian Rogers before he retired there at Bellevue when, when I was going to school in Memphis for a few years. And um, oftentimes, 
you know, of course, he's the Pope of preachers, modern preachers, that is, anyway, and I would certainly never say anything negative about Dr. Rogers. However, oftentimes when he would handle an Old Testament narrative, I noticed that he would handle it the same way that he handled uh, his New Testament epistles or the book of Romans or um, the Gospels, whatever he was preaching from. His sermons all sort of felt the same way. And so, again, um, even some of the greats have, um, I think, mistakenly um, taken and forced an outline, a forced outline taken from the epistles and from the New Testament and forced them on the Old Testament narratives, and we certainly want to avoid that. Uh, Number three, preachers make the mistake of mining out the kernel from the narrative in their study. Then they decide to discard the husk when they preach. And so they open up the book of Ruth, they turn to chapter 3, they'll study it, they'll pull out the kernel, and then they'll discard the husk, and then they'll get up and just open up that kernel to their people. But we need to understand that that kernel of truth, that objective truth that is communicated, for example, in in Ruth chapter 3, Um, actually is embedded in a genre called Old Testament narrative. It's a narrative. And so you don't want to get up and just discard the Old Testament narrative and just say, say, listen, this is what God is saying, and then unpack that for the next 30 minutes. You certainly want to keep um, both the, um, the, the husk and the kernel together. And so oftentimes what we see is that the um, preachers will lift a theological idea or truth from the text, and then they'll build their sermon around that. Uh, Puritans, of course, were known for doing that. They would take a text like Ruth chapter 3, they would pull out a theological truth, and then they would just turn it for about 45 minutes, and then turn it for 45 minutes more in uh, application. And, and they, would, they would discard the, the husk and just, uh, for them, the kernel was some theological truth. By the way, that's what's happening oftentimes uh, with guys in terms of the way they handle the, um, the text. Um, Even, I call them modern-day Puritans, they're doing modern-day theological exposition, whereas they just treat the text in in the way that all they want to do is pull out a theological truth and then preach on that for the rest of the time that they have together. And so it's one theological truth after another theological truth. Um, If you're wondering, you know, someone that might do that, for example, uh, John Piper does that kind of preaching. It's, It's a theological exposition. It's a handling of the text. And we certainly... Um, want to uh, avoid that. that. Again, that's going back to the Puritans and some of those before them. So, don't make the mistake of mining out the kernel from the narrative uh, and then discarding the husk. You certainly want to get up and you want to walk them through the narrative. Number four, this is the reason that sermons don't feel like narratives. Preachers don't retell the story well. That's if they tell it at all. Like I said, some guys just get up and they you know, you've heard the story of David and Goliath. Now let me give you five principles out of uh, Second Samuel or First Samuel or whatever it may be. And um, so make sure that when you get up, you actually retell the story. And here's the key word, well. If you want your narrative sermons to feel like narrative sermons, then you must be able to retell the narrative well. We deal in words, friends, and it's vitally important that you Um, tell the narrative well. In other words, we've got guys that'll get up and just assume that your audience knows the story and they will deliver it like they're like somebody's delivering the 10 o'clock news. Now just reporting it like that. But you shouldn't deliver the the narrative like you're delivering the 10 o'clock news. Rather, you should tell the story and tell it well. Every single night when I put my two and a half year old son down, uh, you know, to go to sleep, I'll put him in his crib and he'll say, Daddy, do and, do and, do and. And so what he's saying is, is he wants me to do this little thing that I do with him every single night. I'll lay down next to his crib and retell the day. And I use the conjunction and constantly. So, you know, when you got up this morning, who got you out of your crib? Mama came to get you. And, and then what'd you have for breakfast? And we'll just recount the day and I'll just and, 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 and I'll tell the story, the narrative of the day. I put him down uh, last night and he said, tell the, tell the fair story, daddy. Do and. Talk to, I took him to the fair on Friday. And so I walked through the whole, all the rides that he rode, and this, and we did this, and we did this. By the end of, end of it, of course, he's asleep, or he's asking me to run through it again. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it's, really, it's, it's really, in some ways, helped my preaching in the sense that that's the way I approach telling these narratives. I don't approach telling these narratives like I'm delivering the 10 o'clock news. Uh, 
You know, let me just give you the facts, nothing but the facts, you know. But instead, I approach these narratives like I'm telling a bedtime story. And so, um, you know, can the reverend tell the story has been a question uh, for us. And so we need to retell the story and we need to retell it well. And so those are some reasons that oftentimes our Old Testament narratives don't feel like narratives. We haven't done a good genre analysis. We treat all of the narratives uh, that we preach the same way that we treat the other genres, particularly the one genre that we've mastered. Um, we make the mistake of, um, of mining out the kernel and discarding the husk when you've got this great narrative a story. Uh, there oftentimes we'll jettison that and just lift out a theological truth and preach on it. And then oftentimes we don't retell the story well. So let's make sure that even when we open up the book of Ruth chapter 3, we don't um, fall into some of these traps. And um, let's make sure that when we preach Ruth chapter 3 or any other narrative, that we um, make these narratives feel like narratives, okay, when we preach them. Let me give some keys to remember when preaching negative narratives. Number one, if you are dealing with, for example, one chapter, like in this case, um, Ruth chapter 3, if you're dealing with, for example, one chapter or, or just one scene, don't lift that section out of its literary context, okay? In other words, don't take Ruth chapter 3, if I'm going to build a sermon on Ruth chapter 3, don't clip it at the end of Ruth chapter 2 and at the beginning of Ruth chapter 4. Don't take Ruth chapter 3, put it on the clipboard, maybe do a high definition zoom and start studying that text apart from its literary context. Uh, that is a tremendous, tremendous danger. You run the risk of eisegeting the text rather than exegeting it. As you know, the difference between exegeting a text and eisegeting a text is when we exegete, we are actually pulling out of, ex, out of the text. And when we eisegete, we are reading something into the text. Uh, it's, it, it's akin to um, scriptural rape when you, when you stop and think about it in the sense that we're forcing something on the text that's foreign to the text. By the way, if that sounds egregious to you, it should be. Um, and so we don't want to lift, for example, chapter 3 out of the text, out of the literary context it's, that it's in and just focus in on that because what will happen is, is we'll divorce, divorce it from its context and we will end up reading something into the text that the author did not intend. And so um, make sure that you, um, number two, keep the whole narrative's purpose in mind as you zoom in on a section. So is there anything wrong with zooming in on chapter 3 of the book of Ruth as we preach through it and just preaching that one uh, chapter as one sermon, one standalone sermon? Nothing wrong whatsoever. But as you zoom in on it, make sure that you also take the time then to zoom out and look at it in its context. And so consider where the scene that you're preaching or the chapter that you're preaching, consider where it fits the narrative, uh, how it fits into the narrative, how the narrative fits into the book, how the book fits into the canon. As you guys know, if you pan out far enough, all of a sudden you pan out to Barashit, Bara Elohim, all the way to the last amen in Revelation 22, you've got this meta-narrative, this whole canon of Scripture, and um, somewhere, Ruth chapter 3 fits in there. And so if you pan all the way out, you've got this meta narrative of Scripture. And so I want to look at Ruth chapter 3 in that meta narrative context, but I also want to zoom in and I want to keep zooming in and zooming out and keeping those things in tension uh, as I try to determine what Ruth chapter 3 is all about. And so make sure that you keep the whole narrative's purpose in mind. I want to know what the writer of Ruth was doing. I don't want to just preach Ruth chapter 3 without being informed by Ruth chapter 4. Again, I'll um, find something in the text that the author did not intend. And so uh, make sure that you zoom in and zoom out and keep these things in, um, in context. Number three, think ends. Think ends, E-N-D-S. Uh, and probably some of my colleagues have already talked about this, but again, just some things to remember while you're preaching narratives. 
make sure your central proposition of your sermon is communicated, your main idea is communicated um, at the end of your narrative. Save it until the end of your narrative. Uh, again, oftentimes we're so used to doing deductive preaching in terms of structure. We want to get up. We want to say, this is what I'm talking about. Then we go to the narrative to prove it. The genre does not dictate that kind of structure. The genre dictates this kind of structure. Walk through the narrative first, then arrive at your central proposition of your sermon. Hold it out there and then derive your application for your audience. Do you guys see the difference in that? And so, um, Make sure your central proposition of your sermon, your main idea, whatever nomenclature you want to call it, your thesis statement, uh, what's true plus what to do, make sure that you save that until the end. That's why I say think ends. Arrive there like you're taking your audience on a journey. Again, that's what guys do when they discard the husk. Uh, They've already taken the journey in their study. They've determined the main idea in the text. And so the temptation is to just get up and just say, hey, this is what, you know, you know, you know Ruth chapter 3, this is what the Bible is saying, and then you unpack some propositional truth. That might be biblical, but you discarded the genre, and the genre dictates that you walk them through the narrative, and then at the end of that narrative, you show them in a glorious way the central proposition of your sermon, Okay. So avoid that deductive forcing on these Old Testament narratives. And um, as a rule of thumb, you should probably save your application points for the end of the sermon. Now why? Why do we save our application? Again, as a rule of thumb, some, some of you will choose to do application throughout. I think there's a danger in doing that. Why do I, I um, encourage you to save your application points for after you have... have um, rebuild your central proposition of your sermon. Because how can you know what to apply if you haven't mined it from the text first and, and mine the central proposition of the sermon from the text first? And so I say walk through the text, mine, give them the central proposition of the sermon, and then let your application be tied to that central proposition of the sermon, then you will not find yourself of doing what Haddon Robinson said is oftentimes done. He said, most oftentimes heresy is preached in application. And so if you bring out that central proposition of your sermon and then derive your application from that central proposition of your sermon, you are doing what I call text-driven application. So think ends. Bring out your central proposition of your sermon later. Um, when you apply, apply after you have already revealed your central proposition of your sermon. And then C, maybe the most difficult for me to communicate, uh, but one of the things that will really help you is that if you do have propositional points throughout your outline, which some of you are so accustomed to doing, you'll write an outline and you've got a propositional point, you know, something like, um, you know, we should trust God. Point number one, and then you'll unpack that. Let me illustrate it. Let me apply it. That's generally how we do deductive um, structural preaching in terms of individual points. State the point, unpack it, illustrate it, prove it, um, and then apply it, okay? Uh, If you want your sermons to feel more like narratives, take that propositional truth, if you have a propositional truth in in your point, and move it to the end and um, walk through the narrative and arrive at those points and then give those points if that makes sense. So um, what you do on a large scale with your sermon in terms of saving your propositional, uh, your, your central proposition of your sermon for the end of the sermon, do that with your individual points. Walk them through the narrative, then state the main idea of that particular section. Does that make sense a little bit? So again, rather than stating Let us trust God and then unpacking it. Take them to the narrative. Show the character in the narrative trusting God and then arrive at this with your people. You know what we need to do? Like the character we just learned about, we need to trust God. So it's a matter of moving that propositional truth um, from one section, the beginning of your outline, that particular section, to the end of it and arriving there inductively. If you do that, you think, you know, that's such a minor thing. 
it takes a sermon that is narrative in nature and it makes it feel more like a narrative. So you, um, you start the sermon, you walk through the first move or scene and you arrive at a propositional truth and you state it. You walk through the second uh, uh, scene and you state your um, second propositional truth. Then you walk through the third one and you state it, state it like that. And it feels more like a narrative. The thing that joins the sermon together to make it feel like a narrative is actually you walking through the narrative itself. And so if you do have propositional points throughout your outline, consider moving each, each point to the end of their section and arriving at each point inductively as you move through the narrative and your outline. D, make your section headings transitional statements instead of points. Um, you know, rather than um, thinking about, okay, I've got a point, number one, point number two, point number three, think about them in terms of acts or scenes or moves. Scene number one, scene number two, scene number three. And um, walk through that scene and then arrive at your um, objective truth that you want to state. So um, this will keep the sermon moving and remove the traditional feel of a deductive sermon. Okay? Just remember, this is not a deductive outline. This is not, you, you're not preaching from Romans. You're not preaching from Corinthians. You're preaching from Ruth. It's a different genre, and so it should impact the structure, and the feel of the sermon will certainly feel more narrative if you handle it this way. Now, guys, listen, I'm, I'm not giving you thought or theory here. Um, I teach introduction to preaching and advanced preaching here at Southwestern, and oftentimes, listen, I listen to sermons, I grade sermons online from guys that um, aren't taking our residential classes, and I can just tell you that oftentimes we've got guys that I'll have to write on their evaluation sheets. You preached a narrative sermon, but the sermon did not feel like a sermon, and here's the reason why, and it's a very common mistake. And so for some of you, going from you know, that deductive structural outline to something more that would fit an Old Testament narrative is a challenge. It's like changing your golf swing. Um, which, by the way, would probably help me. I look like I'm killing snakes when I'm out there. But uh, it's difficult, but once you get it down, uh, you're actually going to uh, be better off, okay? Uh, number four, in terms of keys to remember when preaching narratives, the narrative itself is an illustration, okay? The narrative itself is an illustration, but you may use illustrations to help give insight to the narrative or an application point at the end. And so don't fear using illustrations. Now, you don't want those illustrations that you use to overpower the narrative. For example, again, if I'm preaching Ruth chapter 3, um, I don't want to discard the, the, uh, the husk, hold out the kernel, and say this is what Ruth chapter 3 is about, and then launch into some extended illustration about my life, um, you know, some traumatic event that God brought me through in college, Great illustration. Spend 10 minutes on that, three minutes on the text. The illustration then, my personal illustration, would then be overpowering the book of Ruth chapter 3. And I, I want to make sure that I avoid that, and I want to make sure that I communicate the text, weave my illustration in, but do not allow my illustration to overpower the text, okay? And um, oftentimes it's good to use with these narratives word similes, uh, metaphors, full-blown illustrations that give us an understanding, a, particularly a 21st century audience, a better view um, of the text, what it means. Um, it helps them relate with the ancient text. It helps them relate with you. Um, for, for example, Ruth chapter 3, I could share the illustration um, if I so desired about my wife and I. We, um, we, um, I told you about my two-and-a-half-year-old son uh, a few minutes ago. You know, we prayed for 20 years, and we dealt with infertility in our marriage. And um, it was hard, and it was tough. And we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed, and God's, God's hand of providence said no every step of the way. Everything we tried, God, uh, and I mean, you come to a place where you, at some point, you just say, you know what, God, you're sovereign. This is outside of my control. I'm going to be like Zacharias and Elizabeth, and I'm just going to serve you. 
there in the book of Luke. I'm just going to serve you. If I die like this, I'm happy. I'm your child, you know, and you're ultimately, ultimately you're sovereign, okay? Great illustration about how through the providence of God, I was at the Southern Baptist Convention, the annual meeting uh, in the state of Oklahoma, talking to an acquaintance, not even a good friend, a pastor friend. And he, he mentioned the fact that there was somebody in their church that was um, going to give a child up for adoption. I said something. Next thing you know, by the providence of God, God gave us Christian, my son. God answered our prayers. I can't tell you how awesome it is when God comes through like that. And again, now listen, I didn't, you know, if I was telling it to a congregation, I could tell that narrative, that little illustration a lot better than I just gave it to you. But what I'm saying is, is that's exactly what's happening in the book of Ruth chapter 3. Naomi has a desire to help Ruth find a husband, okay? And um, they set forth the plan to help Ruth find a husband. Naomi even tells Ruth what to do. Put on nice clothes. Put on some perfume. She tells her what to say, everything. At the end of the day, it was through the providence of God that Boaz extended um, his hand in marriage towards Ruth. And God came through. God met the need. That is exactly what I just told you in my illustration with the adoption of my son. Now, um, obviously, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's close enough. Are you tracking with me a little bit? Now, listen, I want to use the illustration, the adoption of my son, with the narrative in Ruth, not the other way around. I want to use Ruth to launch into a 25-minute story about me and about how, you know, um, so... I, I tell you that to tell you to be careful about using your illustrations and allowing them to overpower the text. Retell the story, retell it well, illustrate the story, illustrate it well, but um, um, use illustrations that give insight into the narrative, but don't let them overpower the narrative itself. Okay? Everybody with me? Number one, many Old Testament narratives don't feel like Old Testament narratives. Number two, keys to remember when preaching narratives. Now, let's turn our attention towards Ruth chapter 3. Let me give you some preaching tips. Um, I'm approaching Ruth chapter 3 now to preach it, okay? Number one, I want to determine the characters, which is pretty easy in the book of Ruth, right? You've got major characters. By the way, if you're dealing with another um, narrative, sometimes it's more complex. You don't just have three main characters. Uh, you might have a foil character, uh, you might, you know, you might have a Laban in there that's, that, you know, that the, the, the author is using. And so determine the characters. And I would say make sure you determine main characters. So in, in this case, we have Boaz, we have Ruth, we have Naomi. Those are our characters. Then you want to determine the scenes, okay? So um, if you look really closely and you, you look at chapter 3, um, you actually have three natural divisions, uh, if you'll skip down in the outline to the moves in the narrative, down there under number four, Ruth three sermon helps in your outline. You've got the home scene. It's on the back side there. You've got the home scene, Naomi and Ruth, verses one through five. So in verses one through five, Naomi is talking to Ruth. Okay? They hatch a plan. Then it's almost like a movie. The scene shifts from the home scene to the um, field scene, okay, through the, to the threshing floor. And that scene is verses 6 through 15. So that's scene number 2. That's Ruth and Boaz. So again, scene number 1 is Naomi and Ruth. Scene number 2 is Ruth and Boaz. And then guess what? Back to scene number 1 in scene number 3, verses 16 through 18. That is your third home scene. Does that make sense? So again, I open up the text. I want to determine who are the characters. Got three major characters here. Um, and um, these are my scenes. These are my, nat my natural divisions. So that when I'm unpacking chapter 3 for my audience, I've already got my divisions there. I've got my three moves um, in the outline. Now, back up to number 3 on your outline. Um, Roman numeral 3, number 3. Determine any historical or cultural references that a 21st century audience 
wouldn't understand and think, and think of ways to explain these to your audience. Okay? Determine any historical or cultural references that a 21st century audience wouldn't understand and think of ways to explain these to your audience. Okay? Now, uh, in Ruth chapter 3, what kinds of historical or cultural references um, do you think that I would need to mine out and explain to a 21st century audience? Well, like in verses 1, 9, and 12, you've got this idea of kinsman, redeemer, okay? Kinsman, redeemer, it's rich. I wish we had time, by the way, in your notes, jot down Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, because that's where the thought comes from, the book of Deuteronomy. Um, but when, when you say kinsman, redeemer to a 21st century audience as you're preaching Ruth 3, they have no idea what that is. And so guess what you've got to do? You've got to study what a kinsman redeemer is. You've got to study the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25. You've got to um, explain to your people, hey, this is what a kinsman redeemer was. So when they come across the Goel in verses 9 and 12, the redeemer there, um, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, look at verse 3. Um, Wash yourself therefore and anoint yourself. Put on your best clothes. Okay, 21st century audience has that. Go down to the threshing floor. What's that? They don't know what a threshing floor is necessarily. And so you've got to study a little bit, and you probably do well to explain to them um, what a threshing floor is. Uh, look at this odd scene in verse 9. He said, this is uh, Boaz. You remember he, you know, he has his feet uncovered. He looks at her. And, um, well, you could pick it up in verse 7 uncovered his feet. She lay down right there. Uh, she lay down there. Verse 9, I am Ruth your maid. Look what she says. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative, redeemer, kinsman redeemer, go hell. Okay? So what's this idea of, of what does she mean when she says spread your covering over um, your maid here? Again, you have to do a word study there. You have to dive into that. Um, you look at the word there, kanef, kanaf, and um, you look at this Hebrew word, and it means wing. And then you study a little bit further, and you read what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8. Oh, by the way, that's, that's worth turning to. Quickly, I'm not going to ask you to, you know, at least jot it down in your notes, and I'll read it for you. But look what the Bible says. This is the very same Hebrew word in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8. Then I pass by you. This is, this is God talking about passing by unfaithful Jerusalem or Israel. Then I pass by you and saw you, and behold, you were, at that you were at the time for love. Then look at what God says to Israel. So I spread my skirt. It's the same Hebrew word for wing or covering in the New American Standard. So I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. Now notice what God does here. I also swore to you and, 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 and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God. So there in the book of Ezekiel, God comes to Israel. He throws his skirt over her and he betroths her to himself. God weds Israel to himself by that act. And so when we read in the book of Ruth, this kind of imagery, we're able to explain it to our people. Uh, in the book of Ruth, when, um, when, when Ruth goes in there, Naomi tells her, go in there, you know, um, tells her everything that she's supposed to do. She goes in, she uncovers his feet. Uh, it's, it's, it's a risky, risky thing for her to do extremely risky. Number one, the only kind of people that came to threshing floors at night were prostitutes in terms of women, okay? And so Ruth is going to go there where Boaz is lying, and she's going to uncover her feet. By the way, she dolled herself up, for lack of a better term. Somebody asked me one time, Brother Vern, is it okay for women to wear makeup? I said, well, if a barn needs painting, paint it. I'm, a, you know, I'm okay, you know, 
You know, that, that's what she did. I mean, she, listen, she put on her clothes, she put on her perfume, she goes in, she uncovers his feet. And even when you study that in the Hebrew, and I study it to explain it to my people, it actually can have sexual connotations to it. And by the way, some commentators think that you had this, Naomi tells Ruth to go in and uncover his feet, commit a sexual act. Um, and some of them take that position. Um, by the way, there's a reason I don't take that position. Uh, Boaz will later on tell her that she is an excellent woman. You don't have any kind of sexual act there. But when she uncovers his feet and Boaz sees her, she says to Boaz then, cover your maid. Cover me with your skirt. The average 21st century audience is not going to get that. Some of you don't get that until you read Ezekiel and you understand that actually what you have here is a marriage proposal. It's crazy because you've got Naomi actually proposing to Boaz in that text. Now, Boaz has to accept the proposal. And by the way, there's your tension in the narrative. Every chapter has a tension, uh, every main section that is. You know, you've got this crisis, this rising, you know, tension, and then there's this crisis, and then, of course, it's released. There are two, actually, crises in chapter 3. Number one, whether Boaz will accept Ruth. That's number one. She proposes to him, but guess what? He could say no. What happens if he says no? The plan that Naomi and Ruth have implodes. Okay? Um, and I um, <laughs> hate to get ahead of myself here, but if, if that plan implodes, uh, we don't have Obed. <laughs> we don't have Jesse. We don't have David. We don't have Jesus. <laughs> you know, all right. Uh, and so... Um, she proposes to him, and he could have said no, but he said yes. And so the tension is resolved actually in chapter 3. But there's another crisis, there's another tension in the text. And that is this. There is another kinsman redeemer in front of Boaz. And so he says to Ruth, basically, guess what? You know what? You go on back home in the morning, I'll take care of it. But at the end of chapter 3, there's a question mark. It's not a period. It's a question mark. And the question mark is this. Boaz can't take Ruth as a wife if indeed uh, Ruth, if indeed the other kinsman redeemer that is ahead of him chooses not to relent his position and give that position and that right to Boaz. So that crisis is not res relieved until chapter 4. Are you all tracking with me? But nevertheless, you've got to, as you walk through this narrative, take note of that. Take note of these um, selected words within the narrative, uh, these um, cultural references, these historical references, and you've got to unpack them for your people. And I encourage you to use um, similes, metaphors, uh, word pictures, and illustrations to do this, like in verses 2 and 9. So... Um, this threshing floor idea, I could, I, could, I could communicate that to my audience. Um, the spreading your wings idea, I could communicate that through marriage with my audience. Uh, number four, closely related to that, is to pay special attention to selected words within the narrative. In other words, do a word study on each of these words. So, use your logos or whatever and select certain words to do word studies. I, you know, when I'm dealing with a large narrative, and I, you know, some of you are, you know, probably more disciplined than I. I don't take that, put it, put the whole Hebrew text up on a in a word document and individually parse and decline nouns and verbs. I don't do that. But what I do is I zero in on certain words that that demand my attention. So verses two and nine, for example, goel. I want to study that. Um, I love in verse 1 where Naomi says to her mother-in-law, um, shall I not seek, I love this, security for you. Naomi says, I want to seek security for you. That word is, it, it, it's, it's a sweet word in the Hebrew, manoah. 
and it means rest. It means security. By the way, one of my friends, he named his daughter Manoa. I love it. That's a great, great um, name for a, 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 a female or a girl. Manoa, rest. And, and, and that's what it, you know, I studied that, and you get this beautiful four-or picture there. Um, verse 2 and 9, Redeemer, Goel, study it. Verse 4, uncover. What does that mean? Um, you know, again, this is not sexual advancement in any way. Uh, verse 9, the wing idea uh, that I spoke about earlier. And so I'm zeroing in on this. The, the, um, anytime you find the, um, the tetragrammatron, tron, the, uh, the, the sacred name of God in all caps, Lord, take note of that. Okay, And it's found various times in the book of um, uh, Ruth chapter 3. Number 6, consider the theological point of the text. What's the theological point of the text? Highlight, highlight this as you preach the sermon and spend some time preaching on it. But here's, here's, here's the warning. But do it in the context of the narrative and, and sermon. Okay? What is Ruth chapter 3 about theologically? I don't want to moralize the text. I don't want to eisegete it and read something into it that's not there. What is the theological point of the text? Well, ultimately, it's about the providence of God. Ultimately, it's about God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Now, again, the temptation is to do this. Turn to Ruth chapter 3. What we find in Ruth chapter 3 is man's responsibility working with God's sovereignty. And so let me talk to you today. Let me spend 30 minutes talking to you about Molinism or talking to you about um, you know, determinism, you know, something like that. And, and you, then you run this theological rabbit for the next 25 or um, 30 minutes. You know, let me talk to you about compatibilism here. And, 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 you know, listen, I'm not saying never deal with those things, but make sure that you keep them in the context of the narrative and that you don't just, as the Puritans used to do and so many do in our day and age, pull out that theological idea and then discard the husk. It is about God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, but say what the text says about it. That's what text-driven preaching is. And so don't make your sermon, you know, don't use the text as a jumping-off point for some theological diatribe that you want to go on, okay? So, do you consider the theological point? Yes. Do you preach on it and teach on it? Yes. Just do it in the context of the narrative. Okay, number seven. Save time for a Christological connection or move towards the gospel that is hermeneutically warranted by the narrative. Preach Christ to the lost and draw the net. Okay? Dr. Smith will come up here in a, a couple of hours and um, talk to us about preaching Christ to the lost and drawing the net. Let me just remind you of something. The foundational text that we have when we... Um, defend text-driven preaching is 2 Timothy chapter 4, right? You know, all Scripture is theonoustos. It's given by inspiration of God. It's profitable. It will tell you what is right, what's not right, how to get right, how to stay right. You know, and preach the word, kerugzon, ton, logon. I mean, we love that text. And we as pastors, we stand up. This is the reason we do text-driven preaching. You ready for something? Paul says this in verse 5. Do the work of an evangelist. So, Paul says, preach the text and be text-driven. But Paul also says in verse 5, do the work of an evangelist. So, I believe that every sermon, even when I preach on Ruth chapter 3 as a standalone sermon, I should find some hermeneutical bridge that's legitimate to Jesus Christ, and I should preach on the gospel and draw the net and invite people to be saved. Do the work of an evangelist. And we'll let Dr. Smith talk to us more about ways we can do that in this chapter. Okay? All right, quickly. Ruth chapter 3 sermon helps. Just things that I put together, use them. If the, you know, it's, if the bullet fits your gun, shoot it. That's fine. Um, but, you know, there's your text. There's your title. I call it the cooperative program. Um, I'm talking about, you know, not the SBC you know, cooperative program began in 1845. I'm talking about, you know, um, the providence of God, Ruth and Naomi setting forth the plan 
and God blessing that plan. God allows us to cooperate with him. I, I say it like this, effort meets grace, if you want to use that terminology. Um, the occasion is the provision of a husband for Ruth. You know, it's interesting to me how often the Bible gives us a full chapter on the provision of a husband or a bride for someone else. Why would God spend a whole chapter, 18 verses on this? Why in Genesis chapter 24 do we find the finding of a bride for Isaac? Over 60 verses on the finding of a bride for Isaac. Because if Isaac doesn't find Rebekah, there's no Jacob. There's no Israel. If there's no Israel, there's no David. If there's no David, there's no Jesus. And so you got the same thing happening here. And um, so this is the provision of a husband for Ruth. And by the way, Naomi prayed for this. If you remember back in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, she prayed for this. This isn't her setting for some plan in the flesh to try to make the will of God happen. She's being led by the Spirit. She's praying, and the, fan un and the, and the plan unfolds perfectly. So therefore, you've got characters, you've got moves in the narrative, and so the theological question that's raised is, how does God work through the efforts of his creatures? That's, that's the question of providence. And that's raised and dealt with in this chapter. And here's the tension. Boaz can reject, or he may not be able to overcome the problem of not being the nearest kinsman. One of those is resolved in this chapter, as I said before. But here's the major theological idea. God providentially works through our efforts for ultimate good. There it is. That's, that's what this text is saying theologically. God providentially works through our efforts for ultimate good. Okay? Now, when we use the word good there, I've, I've, I've truncated that. But we're talking Romans 8, 28 good. That God causes all things to work, you know, to work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Okay? So... My central proposition of the sermon is this. Since God is at work in our lives, we should act in faith, leaving the results to Him. That's what chapter 3 is about. Since God is at work in our lives, we should act in faith, leaving the results to Him. I communicate that inductively. I walk through those three scenes State that central proposition, and then I unpack it in application, okay? There's your road to Christ. Historical, redemptive, promise, fulfillment, and analogy. Ruth all the way to Jesus. No Jesus, no salvation. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Long before Jesus was born, God was at work, and after his birth, Jesus showed perfect faith in his obedience to the Father. And so you have there, even in analogy, a way to preach Christ, uh, from Ruth chapter 3, by all means, avoid, avoid allegory, okay? Come on, Dr. Allen. God bless you guys, all right?